Uh, I'm, my name's Neil Brennan, and this is the level I'll be at. Okay. If not louder, but yeah, around here. We're lucky it'll get louder. Yeah. If I get heated. <laughs> I'll do everything I can to get under yeah. his skin. My name is Michael Kirk. Uh, I'm sitting here in this extravagant room where I'm about to talk to Neil Brennan, who I've looked forward to talking to since I've suddenly, uh, completely learned everything I can about okay. you in the last few weeks. <laughs> Hi, this is Nick Dawson, the editor-in-chief of TalkHouse Film, and you're listening to the TalkHouse Film Podcast. The people you just heard were Neil Brennan and Michael Kirk, clicking very nicely after meeting just a few minutes earlier, getting Mike ready for their conversation. When we were discussing doing a podcast with Brennan to coincide with this hour-long Netflix special Free Mics, he was very specific about who he wanted to chat with. A veteran writer, director, producer, and stand-up, whose place in the comedy pantheon is assured thanks to his status as co-creator of Chappelle's show, Brennan wasn't interested in sitting down with another comedian, but instead had his sights set on Michael Kirk, the guy who does the front lines. Frontline, the PBS current affairs documentary program Kirk has worked for since its inception in 1983, is for Brennan the greatest show in the history of television, and he claims to have watched every single episode they've put out. If there was ever a perfect time for a conversation between one of the most politically informed comics around and a current affairs documentarian who's won a staggering 15 Emmys, three weeks into the Trump presidency was it. Kirk was in Los Angeles for a well-earned vacation after just finishing his four-hour Divided States of America film for Frontline and had been in part relaxing by checking out and very much enjoying Brennan's work. The two sat down in Kirk's hotel room for a very entertaining conversation about fake news, how news as entertainment led to Trump's candidacy, Neil and Dave Chappelle watching Frontline on the tour bus together, how Errol Morris, Michael Moore, and Adam Curtis have reshaped documentary, what John Oliver told Seth Meyers two days after the election, Neil co-writing Meyers' 2011 White House Correspondents' Dinner speech, which political power player refers to himself as Darth Vader, and much more. My guest uh, is Michael Kirk, who uh, writes and directs and produces many of the front lines that air. They probably air. How many do you guys air a year? 23 or 26, I think. And yeah. you are involved in all of them in some way, but very involved in. I, I make, I have a contract to make three hours, but uh, this year I made 11. Whoa. Um, great. Uh, okay, so the, I guess that qualifies as the first question. <laughs> um, <laughs> and how'd that do? <laughs> yeah, it was fine. Um, all right, so I, the you, the one you have now is the Divided States of America. Yes. Um, I guess w when whenever friends of mine are making documentaries, I always say, I I hope that something unexpected happens. I feel like that's the key to any, particularly feature length ones. It seems like there's got to be some exactly. some twist. Yeah. What is it in the because it's it's more for the record on Frontline. What it what it, what are your hopes going in? So uh, we started the film. We didn't know we did it. We didn't know we started it, but we started it eight years ago when Barack Obama was elected. We made a film called The Choice, which was yeah. every four years Frontline uh, makes a biography where they take the lives of the two candidates, the two primary yeah. candidates, and weave them together so that it's not one hour of one person and one hour of the other, but it's a weave so that as a producer, I've made them starting back with George W. Bush and Al Gore, all the way up to the most recent one with Hillary and uh, and Donald Trump. And the trick is to think of a of a, a narrative structure which allows you to weave. Is it it helps if they're the same age because then it can be yeah. Beatles and Stones or whatever it is on the most obvious level, but also on a policy level. Where were they during X, Y, and Z? So I did uh, Obama and uh, uh, in and John McCain. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that I was doing it, but I was building an archive that over the Obama, the entire Obama administration, I would make eight films. Yeah, about. what's funny watching it, 
was it was a lot of stuff I sort of I was like oh that was from the tro-. like I knew stuff that you did good yeah, good yeah. well then you're a fan I'm a dude I'm I sought you out that's fabulous <laughs> so so uh, we started we started with this idea that you know this is historic we ended eight years later after having done the 2012 one as well where suddenly an angry Obama different yeah. Obama than the 08 Obama is running and uh, and by the time we get would around you cut, do you think angry Obama is the right way to categorize him what would you say cynical yeah okay but there was and this, a bit chastened uh, for sure and 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 had come into Washington remember believing that he was going to unify the country and unify yeah. Washington not understanding as one person in the film says uh, that uh, and believing that he could stop the polarization in Washington, not understanding that the whole game in Washington yeah. is polarized, right? Yeah. That it's all about polarization. By the end of the four years, by the end of the two years when he lost and the, had the shellacking in the midterm, yeah. Barack Obama knew, oh my God, it's not going to go like I thought it was yeah. going to go. He thought he had a transformative idea, transformative personality. Certainly all the people that worked around him believe that, but by the time... Yeah, uh, they lost to the Republicans. They lost their supermajority, and then it's 2012, and it's like, oh my God, he's had the birther thing with Trump in '11. He's had a lot of hard knocks, and suddenly he says, oh my God, and that's when we started to think, hey, divided states of America, we're watching it all happen. Yeah, and we got in close with Boehner and Cantor and started to watch what was happening with them too. As you talk about your friends who make documentaries and you hope something cool will happen, yeah. the fact is. Making narrative documentary television in Washington, D.C. at any given time, if you're aiming high enough, there's there's always the, the biggest surprise is that there might not be a surprise that month, that year. But you know if you've stepped back to 30,000 feet, yeah. you have an unbelievable set of surprises because if my job is to connect dots, as you say, you knew all of that. You may have known all of this yeah. stuff, but you didn't know the context for all yeah. that stuff. And that's what uh, having an eight-year run at a story allows you to have is to step back and say, here's why Obama did what he did. Here's why healthcare failed. Here's where the right was. Here's what Sarah Palin's role was. She wasn't just a joke. Yeah. She was a match in a bog fire yeah. that burned under America for eight years. Well, yeah, that's what I said to somebody the other day, that Trump is the apotheosis of the Tea Party. He is like, the, he's the guy. He's the Tea Party incarnate. He's what it yielded. Yeah. yeah. But I also think he he's the embodiment of it. Like, it feels like all the, there were all these little guys. There was like Rand Paul. There were all these sort of like shaggy guys. Yeah. And then he became like. The, the shaggiest. Standard, the shag, yeah, the king the king of shag. <laughs> um, and, and what do you, whenever I watch Frontlines, do you ever, when you're interviewing these people, you can't betray this on what off camera, but are you like, oh, you idiot? You're such an idiot for saying that on camera. No, I don't play that. I don't play that game. That's the kind of gotcha game. No, no, no. But I'm saying, do you ever find? Do I know do, that? Yes. Yeah, do you they know, they like, just, oh, that's going in the movie? Yeah, they like, just handed me something yes. that goes in the movie. Sure, uh, sure, of course, because what I'm trying to do, but it's not. It's often not what you might think it is. Mm-hmm. It's uh, so. I by the time I get somebody in the chair. I really know as much as I can. I've studied for months on the story, yeah. not to mention years in some cases, and I really know the narrative I'm after. I have these things called the boxes, which is three, four scenes, an act, a five-act structure. Every film is the same. And inside those moments, I know who did what and who said what and what day it was and what they were thinking about. So when I'm interviewing somebody, I know what I'm after, but they don't know what I'm after. Got it. They only know that I want to talk about something that happened. And we're going down, we're going down, we're going down. We're covering the ground. It seems kind of like three hours of an interview with somebody. Yeah. Somebody who's used to four minutes on uh, on uh, Chris Matthews' show. Yeah. And suddenly they're sitting in a chair and they're getting a chance to talk. And the best part of it all for them is there's nothing better than somebody for your ego and everything else than the rapt attention of someone else, yeah. right? Sitting across a chair with a TV camera rolling, and they're asking you the the questions that put you at the center of the biggest stories in American history, contemporary American history. That's what I do for a living, so I sit there with them. Yeah. And they will say something that I will say, 
Ka-ching, that piece yeah. fits. Now I've got it. Now I've got somebody who said it. Now I can go get somebody else, and I can refer to this person having said it, and I can build my story around it. Errol Morris says, uh, in interviews I've read, um, that he will, he's of the give them enough rope school, where he he gets answers by just looking at people mm -hmm. and not, not saying anything. Like Errol, I do, I always tell people this. Um, I ask incredibly complicated and intelligent questions like, what'd you do then? Right. Why? Yeah. Right? What, what did that mean to you? Yeah. When you were sitting with the president, what did he look like at that moment? Yeah. What was he doing? Describe how he, I mean, Robert Carroll, who I read all the Carroll books, in the last year and a half, I've read all of the Carroll books about Lyndon Johnson to sort of get myself in the mood to do uh, uh, Divided States of America and the choice and the Trump film and leading into the, what we're going to do for the next year. Uh, I just, just to get the detail of process in my head and, and how Morris, I mean, uh, 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 Carroll always says, he, he would drive people crazy. Tell us a great story about driving somebody crazy saying, what did the president smell like? What mm -hmm. was his breath like? And then what did he do? And then what did he do? The person thinks they've answered it. Yeah. And you say, yeah, but then what? Well, what do yeah. you mean then what? I'm done. To, he tells a great story about Joe Califano trying to get off the hot seat as he just kept probing, saying, and then what did Johnson do? And then what did he do? And finally the guy, you know, cuts loose and tells a great story about Lyndon Johnson. That's sort of what what I try to do. I try to be really informed and very uh, 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 kind of intuitive with people. I know mm -hmm. when something's coming. I know how to ask sort of basic questions because I'm interested in it. My first question is always, tell me the story of, so that they, they're in story mode. And then, and then at some moments, the critical thing is to just sit there and not say anything. Yeah. Um, as you were talking, I thought of uh, Neil Postman, the the media critic from the. He's now passed, but the book uh, "Amusing Ourselves to Death" he wrote in 1985, and and I feel like it. The premise of the book is that we are because we look to everything as entertainment. That's how we end up with a candidate like Trump. Yeah. Uh, that that's not what, what the point I'm getting. The point I'm getting to is he actually said, I believe, like Mag McNair, uh, Lair, the News Hour, McNeil people, Lair. McNeil yeah. Lair, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, the News Hour people, they said they didn't like adding music to the news. The meaning they don't. It's it's part of the and everything's entertainment. So when I watch front lines, and it is that sort of intrigue music, intrigue, not quite, you don't do stabs or stings, but there's well, yes, some establishing, do. yeah, I mean, yeah. you guys have we some do. establishing shots. The front line's the king of the establishing shot of the uh, of the waiting town car. Well, uh, and, uh, and, and, and what we call the guilty building. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Uh, do you feel... I'm sure you don't, but but do, is there? Do you feel? Do you have mixed feelings about scoring your your documentaries not because it becomes not it's then it becomes not news and it becomes something else. Um, so when Frontline first began, I was a senior producer when the series first started back in the Stone Age, and uh, there was we also had that rule: no music. Mm -hmm. Then I became a producer for Frontline because I wanted to. I didn't want to write a you desk. Want music. I yeah, wanted yeah, yeah. to write, it. and I, and I became a producer so that I could put music. <laughs> yeah, right. No, not at all. But I, but I, I realized. Uh, I, so I have a composer. He lives in Los Angeles. His name's John Lowe. He's unbelievably good, mm -hmm. and uh, I'll send him a cut and a scene. Uh, we'll talk in advance about this is, we used to, we, we really started doing it back with the, the Bush's war films. Uh, so I would say, I need a theme for Rumsfeld. I need a theme for Cheney. I need a theme for, you know, the Defense Department. I need a film for the war in Iraq. I need a, I mean, I, mean, I need a, a cue for that. And we would write the music in a way so that it, it, not that it was editorial, but so that it made it helpful to watch it. You knew somebody was coming. You knew something was coming. You, you know the, the it feels like a lot of menace is what you use it for. Well, I do menacing stories, yeah. so that it, it it should have. Uh, we try not to go too far with it, but I think of the grammar of a film. Mm -hmm. So the gr the grammar of these things, uh, as you as opposed to something that you might see on the news, is 
sort of a storytelling mode. So I'm very interested in narratives. So it's a beginning, middle, and end. I try to drive all films with characters, with a character. So it's a character-driven narrative. Uh, visually, same cameraman, same lighting, same mm -hmm. everything, all kinds of image system stuff that actual uh, theatrical movie people talk a lot about. I worry a lot about image systems. Mm -hmm. And I think about when somebody says something important, I want some sound that says, that was the point, right? So somebody says right. something, there's a little thing, we call it a wooden hammer, which is a thump, yeah. right? You get it, it's yeah. there, and it's just like it would be if you were reading it, there would be an exclamation point, or there would be yeah. a comma, or there would be an ellipsis, or whatever it is. So I've just created, with the music, I've tried to create something that is the equivalent in television documentary grammar, yeah. or whatever it is, current affairs documentary grammar, that uh, helps you watch it and realize uh, what's going on and what our intent is as we move through a scene. This is the beginning, this is the middle, this is the end, this is the main idea, boom, boom, boom. And we do that, as I say, 17 times an hour. By, I mean, and that's literally, that's your plan and you stick to it. It kind of works out that way. We spend a lot of time thinking about a story before. Mm -hmm. We create these things I call the boxes, which are, you know, three or four scenes in a three or five act structure. And we really know what's in there based on everything we've read and all the research we've done and all the phone calls we've made and look at all the stock footage in the world, thousands in the case of Divided States of America, thousands of photographs, tens of thousands of photographs, uh, lots and lots and lots of video. So we've watched it all. Then we create the boxes, then we go out and interview people, and then we build the film. So there's no surprises in my editing room, really, unless something happened in the field that was new and we didn't expect. Or in looking at two things together, we said, oh, my God, there's a truth that's emerging there. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, the role of Sarah Palin, yeah. we thought about, but we had to crack out of that that place we were all in that said, Sarah Palin, she that's was joke. a joke yeah. on Saturday Night yeah. Live, right? Yeah. She was Tina Fey. Mm-hmm. And, and, and once we've figured that out in the field interviewing, we interviewed 67 people on these long, long interviews, right? So you, you kind of know something new here and there. You better have learned something and been open to it. Then you come back and you start to cut the film and you say, Palin fits right here. Yeah. And if Palin fits here, then when Trump hits the birther moment in 11, mm -hmm. he's copying her. He's picking yeah. up something he's learned from her. Then in the process of doing that, you say to yourself, my God, Rush Limbaugh, this guy Mark Levin, uh, all of them, all of them, they're the Greek chorus. They're the people out there who are driving the Tea Party movement. Mm -hmm. They're pushing it along. They're pushing Sarah along, who they've identified as somebody that, oh, my God, this is a voice of, of a movement. Mm -hmm. And then they become the sort of megaphones for that movement. And, in fact, they had more power than anything else. I wasn't really sure of all of that until I started to build the rhythms of the movie, even though I knew what I was after and what the, what the end of the story was going to be. It was the reality that Palin begat or gave or fed talk radio in a big way. I know Limbaugh was around before that in the yeah. Clinton era, but suddenly with the web and everything else, there was a whole n another political force that was out there that wasn't being counterbalanced by Democrats. It was waking up a certain section of America that yielded Trump in the end. We spoke about style for a second. There's, what do you think of, of um, the the people manipulating the genre of, of documentary filmmaking, meaning like Michael Moore being the most obvious example, but on the other end, like a guy like Adam Curtis. Yeah. Like, what do you, because I love Adam Curtis movies. They're bananas. It's Adam Curtis, is a, he makes films for the BBC. BBC, and, right. And uh, you can watch them on YouTube. Yeah, his, his Nightmares film is just astonishing. Yeah, it's a it's hip, one of the most hypnotic things of the last 50 years. Yeah, he's figured out how to roll one thing to another yeah. so that it's like a great uh, nightmare that you don't want to wake up from. Yeah. You want to just keep going because it seems to explain everything. Yeah, I know. <laughs> the thing is, it's like, I don't even know if I agree with this. <laughs> right. And oh it's my not God, it's great. It's disprovable, but they're so... Yeah. Massive. They're really f hilariously it's worth good it. movies. It's yeah. worth it. It's worth um, it. But so what do you think of when you watch movies like that? And and are, and is there a party that's like envies them? Is it, Are there stylistic limitations to making front lines that you are okay. tired of? So a, a couple of, one, a small digression. 
whenever you ask somebody in the journalism business what they think of somebody else in the journalism yeah. business, or maybe in the entertainment business too, you'll tell me. There's two words uh, we always use, scorn and envy. Yeah. That's the two responses to other people's yeah. work, yeah. unless you're really highly yeah. elevated like I am. If you've matured beyond yes, uh, scorn beyond, and yes, envy, you're just, all. you know, it's, yeah. there's room for all of us, Sure, Neil. We can yeah, all belong. There's plenty of jobs out there. Right. There's plenty of opportunities. <laughs> yeah, we're, yeah. On the documentary continuum, mm -hmm. here's the thing. If what Michael Moore does is funny and and interesting mm -hmm. and useful to some people, uh, and he wants to call it a documentary. And, when, when, and realistically, it's subjective uh, biographical filmmaking. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. But that's okay. I mean, here I am. I'm highly elevated. You, I yes, mean, you can course. see Don't evolved, this evolved beyond this. Yes. Uh, so from my perch, I would mm -hmm. say uh, you can call it a documentary, Michael, and Hollywood can call it a documentary uh, if that helps put you know butts in the chair in movie theaters that's fine with me it's a free country but i don't want to then be called a documentary it's okay with me if he wants documentaries but i'm not on that continuum because what i do is nothing like what michael moore does michael moore moves things around yeah. he breaks all the rules he's making a point both comedic and otherwise yeah. you, you could explain why it works comedy better does than comedy I can. and fiction yeah, in the in the same documentary, <laughs> exactly. right? So whatever the definition of documentary is, I'm very happy to take the much lower brow uh, title of current affairs or public affairs television programs uh, and not call them documentaries. I call them films because I try to think filmically and I try to have everybody around me think filmically, like storytelling films mm -hmm. about the truth or about the reality or about an effort to get at the truth, even if it doesn't comport well and even if it isn't always smooth and, and even if it is never funny. Um, my job is something else. And, and somewhere on that continuum is Errol Morris, Right, depending yeah. on the film, and Errol certainly belongs on that line. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, if Michael Moore makes documentaries, then I make current events or public affairs, public television programs or television programs. I can make them for a network or a news division or ESPN or whatever. Uh, but they have a different, they have a different rule, a, a kind of plumb line that runs right through the heart of them, which is we're going to adhere to a a kind of effort to get at the truth, to connect dots, to contextualize important stuff without uh, the fish in the barrel stuff, without the easy, easy stuff. And, and to make it more watchable for you and to make it more powerful for you, I will use the tools of entertainment. Mm -hmm. I'll use music. I'll use good lighting. I'll use great editing. I have an ace editor, I, you know, Steve Audet, ace editor, right? I'm not fooling around with the te te techniques and the technology of storytelling. But what I'm not doing is making a joke out of it. I'm not making wisecracks out of it. It's not my personal vision uh, that I'm uh, out there uh, perpetrating uh, on people. But and, and people can choose to do it or not. They can. I think they may go to a Michael Moore movie for different reasons than they might watch a Frontline, uh, even though they could be the same people. Yeah. Uh, all right. So speaking of Michael, how do you think people can counter the fake news phenomenon? Do you? Because to me, it's like the paste is out of the tube. I don't. I don't see. I don't see how it gets turned around. So let's not put Michael in fake news. No, I agree. Yeah. But he's, but he's, I think it's. I wouldn't put Michael in fake news. But I think it's. What I mean is Michael's very much a, a uh, echo chamber filmmaker, mm -hmm. and he's, you know, orthodox left, and there seems to be a, a big orthodox right that, that mostly exists in the world of fake news, yes. that, that just get all the news from Facebook, and, and that's, that's their— it, It's a terrifying thing that's happening, if only because— I mean, there's always been fake news. There's always been uh, uh, things like this. But there's never been the means of mm -hmm. the, 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 the effective delivery system of Twitter and Facebook and all the other forms of, you know, public dissemination of information. So the scary thing about it is how do you know if you're a sort of person in— I grew up in Idaho, so you're a person in my, my brother. You live in Idaho. And your connection to the world is either network news, CNN, MSNBC, all of whom are twisting and yeah. uh, uh, 
uh, shape-shifting uh, about stories based on, you know, what their particular political persuasion is. And so what do you do? How do you sift through it? Where's the, where's the clarity? Where's what feels like the truth? Uh, because it's fairly expertly done, and now we know the Russians are doing yeah. it, right? So, okay, that's fun. Here yeah. we go again, right? I'm not, I'm not sure what you do about it. I mean, I do what I'm doing. Yeah. Uh, I see phenomena happening. Uh, I'm on vacation right now for the first time in a long time. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm doing things like I'm watching your work and other uh, people's work. Mm -hmm. And I'm very proud to say that back in the, I'm, I'm of the generation that had the 60s in, mm -hmm. in the heart of what we did. And it was uh, National Lampoon and those guys yeah. that woke up a whole generation of kids, I was in Idaho at the time, but woke everybody up to the idea that you could be cynical about the government. They had a Spiro Agnew writing a, a regular, a fake yeah. Spiro Agnew writing a regular column. It wasn't fake news in in the sense that it was, it was funny, it was yeah, comedy, satire, yeah. it was satire, exactly. So uh, what I'm proudest about seeing is what you're doing. I'm, right. I was proud of the Dave Chappelle moment on Saturday Night Live, that yeah. monologue. My God, it, you know, this is going to wake a generation of people up who are unhappy with what the politics of the country are right now in a way that if I, I mean, you can answer this question for me. If I was a comedian, this would be the moment, or I was a satirist, or I was an intelligent yeah. person involved in your business. I would say this is a, is a moment for really talking about what really matters in the society. Yeah. It's, then you run into the next problem, which is uninformed audiences. Um, the good thing about TV shows, Siren Live, Daily Show, Seth, uh, you know, they have their audience. So they kind of have, they're, they're preaching to the choir somewhat. If you go to a live taping of Seth Meyers, you, like, you already like Seth, so you're going to be predisposed to, to, uh, to laugh at the jokes and agree with them. Um, the bigger problem is thinking, like I wrote for Seth for the correspondence dinner that was in the, and we, I mean, we talked about it like, you know, like we'd conquered, you know, Trump. Yeah. I mean, not like we would talk about it a lot, but like it, we'd certainly had the feeling between Seth wrote the Sarah Palin sketches, the Trump, like, uh, and, and, we thought we we got them, and it turns out we didn't. Uh, and so it's the idea of how much good is this doing? So do you write them with that in mind, with no. getting them in mind? You're just Not trying to at be all. funny, we were just right? literally just trying to come with jokes. Seth, right. And, right. Seth told me he saw John Oliver three days after the election, and Oliver walked in, and Seth goes, we did it. <laughs> And I was like, we sunk him down to the ground. He's not coming back. Uh, yeah, it's like this thing of there's a, there's a, I don't think that anyone's going to admit that there's a futility to it. Uh, but there is this, there's an echo chamber to it that's, that's, uh, I, I'm curious. I feel like there's moderates that didn't get the message that thought Trump was going to be one thing. I almost feel like speaking to them. Like that was the thing. I, I did a Daily Show thing last week, and that was the thing of like people that thought you were, it's like, no, this is who he was. The people that are going to vote for Trump are are kind of predisposed to want to vote for Trump. I don't think that, I, but I think that there's like a 20% wiggle room of people that are, that will watch television and go, oh yeah, that were influenced by Sarah. The well, by Sarah and, and, and here's the thing: we're we as we're doing this conversation, we're three weeks into the Trump administration, mm -hmm. three months in, six months in, eight like I said, every in. day's a year. It's gonna yeah, you're, but you're gonna have, you're gonna watch. If I'm watching wild swings taking place just inside the Oval Office yeah. and in the close environs, uh, you. I mean, I would assume uh, the the fodder that is available for you, the awakening that can occur in America, the and I, I presumably, in some ways, it seems like you're the antidote to uh, fake news on uh, uh, on uh, Facebook and other things. Yeah, and you're uh, because you're watching and listening to the news, and others are going to watch and listen to the news as well through you. Yeah, I mean, I the good thing about Trump is I feel like. People who think it doesn't matter are never going to say that again, certainly for the next two or three elections. 
I don't think that you're going to get it. They're all the same. It doesn't matter. It's like, okay, that's, you should have learned that lesson from Bush, but maybe people are too young or whatever. Um, and there, I think there was a decency to George Bush that I think people liked that Trump does not have. There was a human decency to George Bush. Um, well, I'll tell you, when we, so I, when I was at Frontline, uh, when I walked into Frontline on 9 11, uh, did, the, did you go? Were you there? The, the, yeah? So I was on my way into the office because in we— In D.C. or New York? No, in, in, uh, in Boston. The office oh, is in Boston. It, got it, got it, got it. So I'm on my way into the—because I have to show a rough cut of the film I'm working on called American Porn, one of the most popular <laughs> front lines of all time. It shows you where we were. So we were making American Porn, right? Uh-huh. Disgusting film. Yeah. Unbelievably, you know— Did it air? Yes. Oh, okay. yeah. And it it's really like, is one of the most popular? Yes, because it's a— Porn. So if you're like typing yeah, in got porn, it. Okay, got it. up got comes it, got American it, got it, got porn it, yeah. is the first thing yeah. that people hit it, thinking it's all about American women. And it and takes a long people a long time for people to have an orgasm to American porn to your film. <laughs> Anyhow, go ahead. So maybe you don't know my audience. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, when we walked when we walked into the building and it, it was happening, uh, all the buildings were going down. We all sat there at Frontline, David Fanning, the executive producer, and uh-huh. others, and we all sat there and said, "This is why we're here." Yeah. We've been on the air for 10, 12, 14 years, whatever it was. But this is why we're here. We can now swing into action, and we can tell this story in all of its dimensions. And we did. I made eight films that year, right? Just all kinds of things. Gunning for Saddam. Within three months, I knew it was Saddam they were after and not uh, al-Qaeda. And we, and we reported it, and it was we were the first ones One of them there. was called The Run-Up to War, right? Uh, we, did, we, we did. Yes, we did. It's so many of them. But one was called uh, The Long Road to War. That was two hours? That was two hours. Okay, because that one, I will say, from a personal point of view, I taped this is on VHS. Right. Taped it, went and met me and Dave Chappelle were doing Chappelle's at that point. Took it. He was on a tour bus. We watched it straight through, and he goes, all right, let's watch it again. <laughs> Literally just, like, run it through again because it was Great. such a creep. It Talk about menace. That whole— with the Vulcans and the, it was just so. Like, you know, it aired the night before the invasion of uh, of uh, Iraq. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I mean, so there, there you are. So, it happens at nine eleven when Trump was elected. I went into the office the next day, making uh, you know, divided states of America, and I'm sitting with Rainy Aronson, the executive producer, and the other members of my team, and I said, "This feels like nine eleven all over again. It's time for us to report. It's such a sea change. The people out there who were unhappy." with the way the American government goes, nobody got it. Yep. A lot of the elites did not get how big this divide was. We're making a four-hour film about it. We know they're out there. It was by then not really a big, shocking surprise that Trump had won. At least I could understand why. And I said, now we're here to do that. So on our end, the sort of serious end, as opposed to the satirical end, on our end of the spectrum, we're out there committed and, and really feeling committed to having to do something about it, make these films, get inside, understand it at all of its dimensions, Putin, Trump, everything. Right? Who is Bannon? Who are all these people in a way that we tell our stories? And, and as I say, I think you guys, you guys, all of you super talented people can uh, tell the story from your side yeah. uh, and you're into this. Well, it's certainly that I was going to refer to Frontline as the first draft of history. I think it's not. Obviously, I think the papers and now these daily shows are. Yeah. yeah. What I do agree. you see it as? Certainly the divided, the big, big, big ones like Divided States of America. I mean, in every one of them, I try to do sort of some you can't because you're just in a hurry. Trump's yeah. road to the White House, we had to do in about four weeks. But yeah. we wanted to get it on the air right around the inauguration. Yeah. And we had these other four hours we were maneuvering at the same time. So that's that really is a kind of first stab at what, the, what yeah. it was. We had seven of the top eight people around Trump talking about how he won. Bannon didn't speak, right? Ban- Bannon wouldn't speak. He, he, he loves to say, uh, I know what you guys want. You want Darth Vader. Darth Vader's not speaking today, right? Got that's it. basically his answer. Yeah. And that's okay. In, in the end, whether you get Bannon or not, you can tell the Bannon story. You can almost tell it now. There's enough out there that you can almost tell it now, and maybe I will in the near future or in the next few months, uh, at least as a way to get at what's actually going on behind the scenes. Because yeah. who knows? I mean, there's a lot of press to digitation that is using Twitter and other things to get people to pay attention to these glittery objects and shiny objects. Yeah. But there's something else happening too. And whatever that is, some of the big papers, some of the big 
outfits can get inside there and with sources and other things, find things out, but so can I. And my intention is to try to get beyond the, the instant flash. Or like, I, I love it when the circus leaves the town. Yeah. We go in and, and what you discover is the circus happened, but behind the scenes is Shakespeare. And it's happening right now inside uh, the Trump White House in some form, in some way. And as I say, I'm on vacation, but Wednesday, I start again, right? Um, I had one more question about th another genre that you work in, which is Wall Street finance stuff. Yeah. It's, they're the only movies of yours I watch, and I go, this is too big. I mean, not your films. I mean, the, pro the system— yeah, and the I think the 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 laws are too lax. I just think financial regulation in a capitalist system is almost like a contradiction in terms. Like there are so many people that are just like, no, it's got to be unfettered, and there can be no regulation. And that's the those are the movies of yours I watch, and I feel hopeless. It was when when we made the first one of that series was a film called The Meltdown right after yeah. Lehman Brothers had gone yeah. down, and I didn't. I'll be there a lot of menacing, a lot of a, a lot of menacing music in yeah, that and one. Yeah, a lot Absolutely. of uh, what do you call them? The guilty building. buildings. Guilty building. A lot of right. guilty buildings. You're Lehman Brothers, these big tall black. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know whether to be really scared about what was happening. I knew my own portfolio, which is a grand uh, uh, term for my IRA, mm -hmm. was in serious jeopardy after September of 2008 that things yeah. were crashing all around me. So uh, my own curiosity led me to say, let's, let's tell the story of this. And we got inside of it. And I, all the way up to when we did Divided States of America, and I interviewed Tim Geithner last summer for really the first time at great length about it. And I can still see that he's uh, he's got that look in his eyes. There, was, there used to be a guy named John Goffman who had been part of making the atom bomb. And they said he had a look in his eyes. Yeah, it was like the eyes of a guy who created the atom bomb. Yeah. And I interviewed him once, or I was there when he was interviewed once. And I, I looked at his eyes. And I said, yes, he does have this look in his eyes. Yeah. And I'm sitting with Tim. Uh, last summer, and he has the look in his eyes of a guy who has seen the abyss, yeah. been almost yeah. in the abyss. So right? that's not just his face. He oh, actually, okay, my God. Because so he, he, he does look like he's got a squirrely right. vibe he, to him. I, I think terrified is, is not a strong enough word for what he was and Paulson was and all those guys were terrified. And and everybody who was in that room in, in, in Nancy Pelosi's conference room when they went in and they asked for $800 million and they said, if we don't do it, and they said, well, how bad is that? We can't move that fast and stuff. And they said, if we don't do it, there will be no economy, I think, on Monday or Tuesday. Yeah. Well, everybody who I talked to in that room said, there. everybody took a deep breath and it was as if you were in a, you know, a breathless, airless chamber, just... You know, oh, my God, the idea of that. And I thought, oh, come on, you guys. You know, that sounds great. Chris Dodd is telling us this, a senator from Connecticut. And I thought, you know, there's no way. Barney Frank tells the same story. And I think, uh, 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 really, is it that bad? So for years, I wanted to know. So I'm sitting with Geithner, and I ask him. And he said, honestly, honestly, we thought— not just an American depression, not just the thing that you see the Jodes in and, you know, you think, yeah. oh, the Dust Bowl. Yeah. Not that. Something unimaginable. Worldwide financial devastation, right? Yeah. And we all thought that could happen. All the wise guys, all the smart guys, all the guys who get rich, all the guys who don't want to be regulated thought, oh, my God, that fast. One weekend, basically, and it's gone. Right? And they all really believed it, whether it's true or not, who knows, I'll leave it to others to decide. The most important thing that came out of it for me was that moment where the $800 million billion was about to be spent for TARP is the moment that woke up a Republican, that bog fire that had been, yeah. you know, that was out there, that are the people who elected Trump, who felt the government should not have done that. Yeah, I have friends who said, it should have gone all the way down. Then we'll find out what it is. It should not be buoyed up by that. But I have these other people that I interview that I interviewed in, in yeah. we made three films about this. And uh and and then a big series called Money Power at Wall Street. And uh and in every case, all of the people I could find from different political stripes, not the people out in America who admittedly lost their jobs, yeah. lost their businesses, some people lost their IRAs, lost their retirement accounts, were really angry about what happened. But that anger is 
could be said is that's an anger about where was the regulators? Yeah. What happened? Yeah. How did this get out of control like this? But others, others, you talk to them and they say, we were that close. We, if we would have really let it go, it would have been all over. And what does that mean? Like, what does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> you know what I mean? What does yeah. it mean? It means yeah. different things to different people. Yeah. Does it mean the Stone Age? Yeah, I mean, you does know? it mean carnage? Like, as the general People Trump. fighting in the streets? Yeah, exactly. Carnage. Like, carnage. I don't know. Who uh, knows? Who knows? Yeah, but I believe them. Do you know what I mean? I understand Too Big to Fail as a concept and the fact that people don't. It's almost like the same people, they don't want regulation. Uh I, it seems like they're, 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 there's a contradiction there. Yeah. Like yeah. they don't want regulation, but they do want, they do want, you know, corporate socialism. Or as corporate as we welfare. talked about in The Choice, the film we made about Obama, I mean about uh, Trump and, uh, and Clinton. Trump, when he was, you know, going bankrupt for the third to the sixth time on his uh, casinos in, uh, and all the banks wanted, they wanted his yacht, they wanted his house, yeah. they wanted the, the, the uh, Plaza Hotel. They said, you know, you're out of control. He sat in a room with 40 bankers yeah. at Trump Tower, and they all said, okay, now we're, we're going to face a decision. Is the stuff that you have worth less if we take it all take away it, from yeah. you, or do we let you keep your name on it, but yeah. you're just a salesman for us. You're the P.T. Yeah. Barnum of this business. When Trump came out of it, the bankers, we talked to a couple of the bankers who were in the room, and they said, we realized this guy, you know, doesn't know enough about economics uh, uh, to have, like, like a, it, it was impossible to believe that he'd had an economics class in college. He's sitting yeah. in this meeting with the bankers, but he's too big to fail. Yeah. We, we realized that this guy was too big to fail. So you've, you now have a president of the United States yes. who's uh, uh, moving in some direction to try to prove— that the things he believed about economics, yeah. about regulation, about the government, about the banks, are right. Yeah. Are right. Right? So yeah. my job, of course, happily for me, is I get to go find out whether he's right or wrong and try to get after it about that and so many other things uh, and get after it so that people like you and others— can get an early warning, an early enough warning, I hope, to know whether we're headed off the rails or not. This is Nick Dawson from Talk Has Film, and you've been listening to Neil Brennan and Michael Kirk on the Talk Has Film podcast. This episode was engineered by Susan Vallett and edited by Mark Yoshizumi. The TalkHouse podcast producer is Elia Einhorn. For more filmmakers talking film and TV, visit TalkHouse.com slash film. Subscribe to TalkHouse Film and TalkHouse Music Podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, where you can find all our previous episodes. And while you're there, please rate and review as it helps others to find the podcast. It's really nice when you get some form of recognition, whether mm -hmm. it's a paycheck or a special yeah. on Netflix or mm -hmm. whatever it is, a, a, an award, mm -hmm. whatever floats your I boat. I only get nominations, but go ahead. Okay, well, even yeah, no, yeah, it's yeah, nice fine. to be nominated. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's, 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 it's not as nice. Right, it's, not, it's, it's probably not as nice.